I spoke, as Luke said, I spoke at the conference. This, first of all, it's absolutely awesome to see so many people in this room. It's quite kind of daunting, actually, so, but, it, but it's fantastic. Um, and as Luke said, I spoke at, at his conference over the past weekend. Um, and one of the things Luke said, actually, was that I work for him. And he said it, he said it kind of uh, tongue in cheek because I don't work for Luke at all. I've got no allegiances to discover strength in any way at all. Um, but my research does. Uh, my research works for every personal trainer that's in the industry because it doesn't, I, I don't do research for academics. If I do research and the only people that read it are academics, then it serves no purpose. If it never trickles down to the, to the client base, if it never trickles down to people in the real world, then it serves no purpose at all except to maybe boost my own ego and my own pay grade, which is not completely redundant, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so as Luke said, I, I, work for, I work for you, fundamentally. So first off, whenever I'm in town for this conference, I getting some workouts with the Discover Strength staff and I spend a ton of time chatting with these guys. But more importantly, over the last, well, last year and this year, I've got a chance to speak to you, which is you know, essential for me, it's really important for me. It's a fantastic opportunity to really speak to the people who are in the trenches, as it were. You know, you guys are doing the workouts. So, so when Luke invited me to, uh, or gave me the opportunity to speak to you guys again this year, um, I absolutely jumped at it. Um, and because it's not a completely kind of formal academic presentation, um, I, uh, I went with a bit, of a, a bit of a spin. I kind of deviated a little bit outside the box, hence the title of this presentation, which I'm going to get to in a second. Now, back in Southampton, I share an office with a psychologist. And psychologists are some of the most fortunate people on the planet because when they do a conference presentation or a poster presentation or anything like that, they get to come up with really quirky out there titles. And it's really interesting and exciting and, and brilliant. And as an exercise physiologist, we don't. So it's, it's really dull and boring and, and interesting at first title. Um, so I went, I went out there, I went outside the box a little bit. And this is as far outside the box as I'm comfortable with, just so we're all clear. So the title of this presentation, How to Save Your Flugel Binder. So, first thing is, excuse me, I've just, gave, just given it all away. Anybody know what a flugel binder is? Shoelace. Yeah, absolutely. It's the tip at the end of your shoelace. So, and if you're sat there thinking, this is going to be a really weird presentation, then you're probably not far off, but it's not all about shoelaces. So a flugel binder is exactly that. It's this, this tip at the end of your shoelace that stops it from fraying, stops it from unraveling, keeps the shoelace intact. Okay, apparently invented by, who was it, Dr. Wolfgang Flugel, not patented and therefore the name didn't stick and apparently is now an aglet. That, this is not the take home message of this presentation. So if anybody's making notes, you don't need to write this bit down. Okay, but this, this is a great for an analogy because what we are trying to save is our telomeres. Now, I should first of all clarify, this is not specifically my area of research. So I've used quite a few verbatim quotes here so that I can give you the, the, the real picture on things. So as this reads, a, re a telomere is a region of repetitive nucleotide sequences at each end of a chromosome which protects the end of the chromosome from deterioration. Okay. Each chromosome is made up of our DNA, tightly coiled around our proteins. So basically, this is our flugel binder, or our telomere, at the end of our, our chromosome. This is what's referred to as junk DNA. So as our cells replicate, and they will replicate with everything we do, um, we have this kind, of, this kind of safety net. We have this flugel binder, this telomere, that as the cells replicate, if we lose a bit off the end, it's not too important because the actual part of the DNA that we want to be transferred from one cell to the next, from one chromosome to the next, remains intact. So it makes perfect sense, right? Okay, so this is the issue. As cells divide and multiply, and they are going to do it, and, and this is part of the aging process, if we eat into the actual part of the DNA that's important, we end up with genetic defects, and I've listed a few there, Alzheimer's, osteoarthritis, uh, osteoporosis, cancer, even skin aging it can be linked, can be tracked back to sort of telomere length. So hence, we're trying to save our telomeres, we're trying to retain our youth. Um, now, I said as cells replicate, and the biggest issue around all of this, the biggest question that's been raised is exercise forces cell replication. We want to rebuild. We break down through exercise, then we rebuild. We re-strengthen, we cause satellite cell accumulation in the, in the muscles to rebuild and, and cause growth and so forth. So 
the question's been asked, is this a bad thing? Should exercise, should exercise be avoided because it's causing this cell replication? Um, so it's a stress, and a any stress is bad. It's worth clarifying that, that when you're an exercise physiologist, from my perspective, any stress is bad. So stress from a lack of sleep, stress because, uh, well, I've got a baby due in two months, I'm pretty confident that's gonna bring some stress. Uh, stress from my wife right now, because she's pregnant and I'm, in, and I'm in Minnesota. So, you know, all of these things are stress. So these are potentially bad for me and bad for my health. Stress because I slept for four and a half hours last night because Luke, flew, Luke and I flew back from Chicago this morning. These things are all stress. Exercise is stress. So can it be bad because it causes increased cell replication? But then we know that exercise is really good for us in a ton of different ways. And specifically resistance training is the best type of exercise for us because of a ton of different reasons, which I'm gonna get into in a little bit. So there's this other, this other argument, exercise is good. And in fact, what we now know from a, from a telomere perspective is that we're switching on uh, protective genes and enzymes, and the enzyme is called telomerase, which can actually lengthen our telomeres. So there's kind of this, w this kind of balance that we need to find. And, and it, this has been the question that's been asked for a long time, what, what do we wanna do? And, and to be honest, this is where we need to take this approach that exercise is prescriptive. Okay, it's not just go out, do a ton of it, do as much as you can handle, and that's great. It needs to be more prescriptive than that. So sticking with the telomeres for a couple more minutes, they've looked at observational studies, and one of the key ones back in, what was it, 2007 there, compared power lifters, compared the telomere length uh, within muscles between power lifters and non-exercising controls. So powerlifters do a lot of exercise, train at a very high frequency, lift very heavy weights, um, non-exercise and controls, don't do any exercise as we say. And what did they find? Well they found there was no difference, there was no abnormal shortening of skeletal muscle telomere length as a product of long-term strength training. So it wasn't longer in the power lifters, but it certainly wasn't shorter than people that didn't exercise. So we can maybe start to say, well, exercise isn't, isn't necessarily bad for us, or certainly this volume and this intensity of exercise might not be bad for us. <clears throat> there still is a bit of a question mark around kind of this dose, intensity, frequency relationship. So more recently, uh, these guys, Jeremy Lowenecki here is based at University of Mississippi, um, and they published a paper where they were looking at volumes and intensities of exercise um, in relation to telomere length. And one of, the key, one of the key issues with all of this is intensity as a term is not used very well within the literature. So uh, myself and some colleagues back in Southampton have kind of really tried to pick up on some definitions with this and intensity is a measure of something, intensity of effort, intensity of load. Uh, and if we're not clear on our definitions, then the literature itself might not really mean much. And that's a big issue because these guys were kind of saying intensity, but it was a very high uh, volume of, of work. So if you're doing 20 or 30 exercises and you're doing three or four sets per exercise, at the end of the workout, that's considered a very high intensity workout. If you do a single set to muscular failure, well that's high intensity, but it's certainly not the same volume or frequency. So we need to kind of raise a bit of a question mark around some of this. We've, they've also looked at um, telomere length of elite athletes compared to age match controls and found that there was, uh, found some interesting data around there and again, found that even with elite athletes, there wasn't a, a, you know, a, a shortening beyond uh, age match controls. Um, but ultimately, the data is generally suggesting, I know this goes back to 2009, but it's a nice summary, that moderate, moderate amounts of physical activity seem better than being too low or being too high. So if we don't do enough, we don't get all the benefits. If we do too much, there's kind of this inverted U-curve, we do too much, we're prob we potentially might do more harm. Okay, which, is, which makes sense for most things. Okay, so the answer within all of this seems to be lower volume, lower frequency, and higher intensity of effort, muscle strengthening exercise. So, 
We've got a paper in review right now which is, which is causing a real stir and I say in review rather than published because right now we're having major difficulty getting it published because it goes against what so many people have said for so long in the industry including some of the big organizations. But all I've done here is I've listed some of the, uh, some of the physiological adaptations, the positive adaptations from performing resistance training so we can see metabolic rate, blood pressure, uh, insulin sensitivity, bone mineral density, reduced back pain, so on and so forth. Just a, we know there's a, a handful and way more than this. I could have put slide after slide, but I don't want to labor the point. Um, <clears throat> we know that there are great benefits from resistance training. And in fact, what I've said a few years back now is that really our key goal is to have a biological age equal to or lower than our chronological age. So I'm 38 years old and every September I get a new cohort of 18 year old students. So the battle for me is am I as strong, am I as fit, am I as fast, am I as good looking as these guys and, and so forth. So I want to be younger than my body says I am or I want my body to be younger than my passport says I am. Um, and I think that's, that's the key probably for all of us. We want a biological age equal to or lower than our chronological age. And for a while we kind of argued this, um, but everybody sort of says, well, can, you, can, you can't reverse aging, maybe you can slow it down a bit and so forth, but you can't reverse it. And actually, even going back to 2007, we now know that we actually can reverse aging. We quite literally can reverse aging. So this is a nice study. Six months of resistance training in participants with an average age of 68 years showed mitochondrial characteristics similar to persons with a mean age of 24 years. So mitochondria is how their cells are responding with energy, with, with um, power production and with energy utilization and so forth. So do we want 68 year old cells or 24 year old cells? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer that. Okay. Um, if your answer is 68 year old cells, you might be in the wrong room. Yeah. Just so that we're kind of um, muscle protein synthesis, whilst lower in the elderly compared to young men and women, increased to a comparable rate following only two weeks of resistance training. So again, a big problem as we age is that one, we don't absorb as much protein, but two, we can't necessarily produce as much muscle. We know muscle's great, we know uh, not just because we get bigger biceps, but we know that it helps resist uh, aging, it's, it's uh, linked to uh, a reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, the, the phrase that I generally like to say is, stronger people are harder to kill. Which makes sense. So, so we've kind of, we know this, we know that resistance training is great for us and we now know that it, it quite literally can reverse aging. So this idea of having a biological age equal to or lower than a chronological age is completely within reason. Now if we go back to our physiological adaptations, what most people aren't picking up on in the industry as exercise, as exercise professionals and as exercise scientists is actually the amount of exercise that was done within these studies. So for example, in this paper, we went back and looked at it and they were training, well, between one and three times per week. They were training, rather than the number of sets, I equated this to a volume in time. So between 20 and 60 minutes per session, which is a total time per week, was between really 60 minutes and 180 minutes. The bottom study was one of our own and we were actually only interested in low back pain. So whilst I've kept it up there, it's a little bit deceiving to think that one time per week for five minutes might be, uh, might be feasible. Although it might not be impossible and I'll, we'll come to that. Um, whilst we're on the discussion of some of the benefits, um, I put some of the psychological benefits up here as well, reduced anxiety, reduced depression, improved self-esteem, improved cognitive function, so on. And again, we're looking at frequencies of two to three times per week and anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes per session, equating to no more than 120 minutes in a week. Now, we would still argue that even this is a higher dose than necessary and that these studies have used this dose because it fits with the existing guidelines, it's easier to publish. If you go to the, to the big governing bodies and you're proposing something that they're not familiar with, that they're uncomfortable with, they are very reluctant to publish it as I'm finding out repeatedly to my peril. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, one of the things that we're saying is that actually a minimal dose for somebody who's currently not participating in exercise or that has very, very little time, a minimal dose approach might even just be to perform three exercises. So we, we, we suggested a chest press, a leg press and a seated row, which targets most of the major muscles of the upper body uh, and the lower body. Um, we said supplementary exercises might include things like an overhead press or a pull down. 
we put in the caveat of where contraindications might occur or where they don't exist, I should say. So for example, if somebody has limited shoulder mobility, if they're an older adult with limited shoulder mobility, then an overhead press might be difficult or a lat pull down might be difficult and so forth. Uh, we then suggested lower, single joint lower body exercises. So again, uh, you know, a large volume of muscle mass in the, in the knee extensors and the knee flexors. And then, of course, uh, things like a lumbar extension, abdominal flexion, neck extension and flexion uh, to protect the spine, to improve posture, to protect vital organs and so forth, and really target the, the remaining muscle that exists. Um, so as a total, this comes out at 10 exercises. We suggested 60 to 90 seconds per exercise, so a reasonable repetition duration. 8 to 12 reps of each exercise taken to muscular failure twice per week. Uh, in total, that equates to if you have less than or equal to 60 seconds of rest between exercise, this comes out at around 30 minutes per workout or 60 minutes per week. Um, now, it's not a surprise that that's probably what most people in the room are doing, and that's what Discover Strength advocate. And at this stage, it's absolutely worth me reiterating, I am not here to sell you on being a client for Discover Strength. I do not work for Discover Strength. I don't get any income from them, although the more I give this presentation, I feel like I probably should. Yeah. Um, this is what the evidence says, and this is why I have, I have an association with these guys, because their training is evidence-based. So, so that's our relationship. Okay, but there's a caveat to taking such a low volume, especially if we're taking only the three exercises for a single set approach. But if we're taking even the 10 exercises, there's two key things that we need to consider along the way. So the first of which is effort. Now this is a paper that we've got in press in Biomed Central Public Health, and really our target for this was the public health system in the UK. Um, so those of you that uh, might know that we have the National Health Service, which basically means that there's a chunk taken out of my salary before I ever see it, and that goes towards my health care, but it also goes towards everybody else's health care if they don't look after themselves. So as you can see, fit, healthy young man, never goes to the doctor, never goes to the hospital because I don't have a need to because I look after myself, and other people that don't are reaping the benefits of what I'm paying for. So I've got, I've got a vested interest um, in trying to make the population healthier. Yeah, it's gonna, if, if it saves me a bit of extra money to buy an extra beer at the end of the week, then I'm happy. Okay, so that's kind of the aim of this paper. And one of the things that we reviewed is, is the current guidelines, the current policy. We looked at the UK, we looked at the US, we looked at the World Health Organization and so forth. And, and there's generally been an approach to a volume of exercise, not an intensity of exercise. But if we look at it, we've said here, our physical, acti physical activity guidelines have a focus on volume and frequency, but this only shows a marginal reduction in morbidity risk. And a, a prime example of this is a study by, by, the, by these guys, by Church, in 2007. So this is 10 years old, so we've known this for 10 years. Um, and they had people exercising at 3.6 METs. So a MET is a metabolic equivalent. So if, for example, my basal metabolic rate is uh, 2,500 kilocalories, then 3.6 METs would be me exercising at 7,500 plus, you know, probably 8,500, 8,600 uh, kilocalories per, per day equivalent. Um, obviously, it would only be for an hour or so at a time. But they found that even people that increased beyond, beyond the guidelines by 50%, so they did 50% more than the guidelines suggested, only showed a moderate, uh, moderate increase. And in fact, it was minimal effect on, uh, on, on a range of risk factors for coronary heart disease. So volume doesn't seem to be the answer. Frequency doesn't seem to be the answer. We can do more and more of it, but it, it doesn't actually help us in the long term, or it doesn't seem to. If we look at intensity of effort, we find that it's a far more meaningful moderator of risk reduction. So as I said, there's, a, there's an absolute mountain of data that says people with stronger muscles, people with more muscle mass, uh, are live, live longer and have a, a better quality of life along the process, which is, which is what we're after. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, these guys have said it for a while, I and mean, one of these papers dates back to 1996, but an exercise, invention, exercise intervention excuse me, with a high intensity of effort 
has been shown, uh, has shown promising efficacy in improving outcomes for a range of cardiometabolic disorders. So these are things like Martin Jabalas of McMaster University. He's the guy that you may have seen on, on the news or on TV talk about sprint cycling, 30 second sprint cycle tasks repeated sort of four or five times with a minute or a couple minutes in between. So they're not even necessarily focused on resistance training. We know that effort is key, whatever the modality. But a big problem that arises is with muscle strengthening exercises. So we said we want the muscles stronger. We said we want the muscles to be, uh, to be acting more like a 24 year old than a 68 year old. So we need to be doing muscle strengthening exercises. But again, our big problem is the World Health Organization under their muscle strengthening, muscle strengthening exercises kind of guideline suggest gardening, uh, mowing the lawn, uh, yoga and things like that. Now, I haven't got anything against yoga and, you know, as a product of my wife, I don't have anything against mowing the lawn either. Um, but it's important that we're doing something that strengthens, strengthens our muscles. And in fact, there's studies that suggest that the people that do yoga, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no benefits, there's no reduction in all-cause mortality as far as muscle strengthening. So if you do yoga, that's great. I, I love that you do yoga. It's actually, I, I actually have done yoga, I find it really relaxing. Um, but that's, that's part of the issue. I find it really relaxing. It doesn't task my, uh, uh, tax my muscles in the same way that resistance training does. So incorporating things like yoga as a muscle strengthening activity under the World Health Organization guidelines is, is, is clearly not the way forward. Uh, people will go out there and think they're meeting these guidelines because they're hitting the volume, they're hitting the frequency, and they're doing yoga. So they're, they're, all, they're all fine, right? But, but they're not. Um, and, and we've suggested here this is probably a result of it being a low intensity of effort. Now there might be a caveat to this for, for people that, that are older, or for people, or maybe for females where it's a different relative effort, um, there might be muscle strengthening benefits. Okay, so it's not, we don't throw it all out, but we just need to take a, a more academic approach to this. So we know intensity of effort is key. In fact, we know intensity of effort is probably the single most important variable. But the second, if there is a second most important variable, it seems to be supervision. So this is a study that we've just published in uh, Biomed Research International. Um, and again, this is with a colleague of mine, James Steele, in, in Southampton, and with some colleagues of mine over in Germany. Now we had, what do we have, 13 males, 10 females, age range of 61 to 80 years. They did a full body workout twice per week, uh, single set protocol, it was about 10 exercises, uh, pretty typical to what most people in the room are, are doing with Discover Strength. Um, we were quite nice over this, we wanted to ease them into it a bit, they'd never done any resistance training before, so for the first two weeks we brought them in and we kind of coached them through the exercise, got them familiar with the environment. Um, we wanted them to train for just a specific number of repetitions, so we gave them a load and we said, just do eight reps, just do 10 reps, that's fine. We didn't go overboard with the intensity of effort that we pushed them through. Uh, for the next two weeks, we upped it a little bit. So we said, we want you to exercise to what we called self-determined repetition max. So we want you to exercise to a point where you feel like you would fail, you would reach muscular failure on the next repetition. So they can complete that rep, but don't, if you think you wouldn't be able to do the next one, then that's okay, don't worry about it, we'll move you on to the next exercise. So it's pretty nice protocol uh, until this point, and then for 14 weeks, they trained to momentary muscular failure. And we were pretty strict over this. If they finished a repetition, they had to begin the next one, as I'm sure the Discover Strength staff do with you guys. Um, and we even said that if once they've begun a repetition, even if the weight stack isn't moving, they have to press against it as hard as they can for a minimum of five seconds. And that way, if the weight stack is even just inching out, we know that they're still applying maximal effort. And of course, then if they finish that repetition, they have to do it all over again. <laughs> so, yeah, it was great, it was great fun. <laughs> so, um, and, then, and then just because we're really nice people, we wanted them to train that bit harder again. So we went to what we called Muscular Failure Plus, and we did a breakdown set. So they trained for Muscular Failure, and then after they've reached that point where they're pushing against the weight stack for five seconds, even if the weight stack isn't moving, we then dropped the load down by about, it was by about 40 or 50%. It was a big drop, and we asked them to do a few more reps. And actually, they loved it. They loved working this hard, as, as most people in the room probably do. Um, hopefully do. Um, and they, and they, 
you know, made huge strength increases as you would expect. We'll get onto that in a second. We tested them for things like leg press, chest press, and seated row. And on this presentation, I'm only going to talk about the strength adaptations that they had. But we also did a, a bunch of functional tasks. So we did what's called a timed get up and go, uh, where, you, where they sat in a chair, they have to get out of the chair, walk, uh, it's about 10 meters, walk around a cone, walk back and sit down. So it's quite a functional task for, for all the people that, that maybe aren't functioning as well. Uh, we had a staircase in the building, so we thought, well, let's just get them to walk up the stairs. See how quickly they can do that. Typical things that we do in day-to-day -day life, because actually, Improving your strength at any of these tasks is great, but if it doesn't translate to anything in the real world, it's, uh, you know, it might not serve the, serve the same benefit. Now, the other key part of this is after, uh, after they'd done this for 24 weeks, we said, we're going to leave the room open for you, and we're going to ask you to sign in if you want to come back, uh, and you can carry on training unsupervised. And we had 13, 13 people wanted to do that. Uh, or 13 people did it regularly, regularly enough for us to keep the data. Um, but a bunch of people didn't. Um, but what, what we did coerce them into is to coming back after six months. So some people carried on training and supervised for six months, and some people went off and did their own thing for six months and, and, and didn't do any resistance training. So what did we find? Well, as you would expect, we found massive strength increases from pre-intervention to post-intervention. 24 weeks of resistance training at that intensity of effort for a single set, twice a week, surprisingly increases your muscular strength in chest press, leg press, seat row. We also found significant strength increases pre-intervention to six month follow-up. So this is just for one of the exercises, but this is their pre-strength. Uh, this is their post-intervention strength, and this is their follow-up. Now this is everybody all together, so you can see there is a bit of a drop. Um, but you can see that their follow-up strength was generally higher than their pre-strength. So we could argue from this, well, actually doing 24 weeks of resistance training and then doing nothing for six months, you're still stronger from that 24 weeks of resistance training that you did, which is great. I love it. Um, there was a significant decrease post-intervention to six-month follow-up, as you would expect, because some people weren't doing anything. But the worrying part is that there was no difference in the decrease between those that didn't come to the sessions, those that went off and did their own thing, and those that actually still came to the gym but exercised unsupervised. They all lost strength to effectively the same degree. So a lack of, somebody said, wow, absolutely right. This is, when we analyzed the data, we were shocked by this. We were like, no, 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 because they had all this coaching. They'd been doing one-on-one -on -one training for 24 weeks, They'd worked super hard. They knew what it was like to work this hard. They'd, they'd done breakdown sets. They, you, know, you know what it's like when you do 24 weeks of training. You kind of learn the protocol. You learn what you're doing. You get into it. So you kind of think, oh, I could do this. I can manage this. But apparently, these guys couldn't. So something went wrong. So it, it can, in, in our perspective, it can only be the intensity dropped to such a point that they lost strength at a similar rate to those that, that weren't carrying on with resistance training at all. Um, and we said, in, we said in the conclusion, these data suggest continuation of resistance training unsupervised offered no additional benefit compared, to, uh, compared with cessation of training altogether. So quite concerning from our perspective, but it actually supports what we've said previously, that supervision is one of the key, supervision is one of the key factors, whether you're untrained, trained, or even an elite athlete. Uh, a, a, an improved supervision ratio, whether it's one to 25 compared to one to five, one to five to one to one, the better the trainer client supervision ratio, um, the, the better the adaptations. Okay, so as a bit of a summary to all of that, because I know I've just thrown a ton of information out. Uh, there isn't going to be a test, so don't panic. Um, we're saying exercise should be about a minimal dose to, to stimulate the adaptive response. It's not about going all out all the time, day in, day out, twice a day. Uh, I know that I'm probably preaching to the choir a bit with that, but it's important that we can, we can see that there's a value in this. We can see the evidence supports this. Uh, there's, there are numerous health benefits. I didn't list them all again on this slide, but we saw numerous physiological and psychological benefits for resistance training. Uh, we know that it can lower our biological age. This is absolutely key. We can lower our biological age. Uh, we know that it's geared around a higher intensity of effort. We also know that it's better when it's supervised. And ultimately, that is how we save our flugel binder or our telemetry. <laughs>